Hello everyone. Today I'm bringing you the final part of my series on the historical origins of folk horror. In this episode, we will take a look at how an anthropological book called The Golden Bough, written by Sir James Fraser, influenced many folk horror stories, and finish this series by looking at how the societal changes of the last 50 years has led to the rise in popularity of folk horror. I hope you enjoy. The Golden Bough By this point in the essay, you will already be aware how influential the witch cult in Western Europe was as a book. But The Golden Bough by Sir James Fraser is almost certainly even more influential. The Golden Bough was first published in 1890 and expanded upon in the decades afterwards. The book is an expansive study of comparative mythology and details rituals and myths from all over the world. The book was scandalous upon its release, but also captured the imagination of the public. The ceremonies and rituals described within the book included human sacrifice and other titillating themes. The book is particularly controversial in the world of anthropology, since Fraser wasn't the most diligent with his references and tended towards favouring evidence that suited his own theories. In addition, the sources which Fraser used to inform his theories later also came under some scrutiny. Many of the sources surrounding harvest customs in Central Europe, which Fraser references, come from Wilhelm Mannhardt, a famous anthropologist of the period. Mannhardt conducted his research by sending out questionnaires asking about harvest customs. The information collected became the basis for his research and theories. Although they are an important primary source, these questionnaires have been heavily criticised as a method for collecting information. Critics suggest that the responses from these questionnaires were hyperbole or even jokes. It's important to note that the ideas presented in The Golden Bough are real folk traditions, or at very least what Fraser thought were real traditions based on the information that he had access to when he wrote the book. Despite being flawed, the book was highly influential to writers who proceeded to incorporate many of its speculative themes into their work. Many of the works that were inspired by The Golden Bough laid the foundations for folk horror. Let's take a look at some of these stories now. The Lottery by Shirley Jackson Perhaps the most influential story to be inspired by The Golden Bough is The Lottery by Shirley Jackson. The story is about a small town wherein there is an annual ritual called the lottery. This lottery has high stakes though because the person who wins the lottery will be sacrificed in order to bring about a bountiful harvest for that year's crops. Jackson herself was intensely interested in the Golden Bough during her time at university. There is almost no doubt that the ritual outlined in The Lottery is inspired by the fertility rituals which involved human sacrifice that are described in The Golden Bough. Just how influential The Lottery is, is really hard to comprehend. The short story was a massive success and provoked a storm of controversy in the literary world when it was published. Many people felt that the story was unnecessarily gruesome, and people hotly debated the story's meaning. But most importantly for us, many people erroneously believed that the story described real events that were taking place somewhere in rural America. Shirley Jackson continued to receive letters for many years after the story's publication, questioning her about the origins of the story and demanding to know where was the town that was practicing this horrible ritual. The Lottery is one of the rare works of literature which has managed to pass into folklore and become confabulated into true history and into the collective minds of the population. The story itself was highly popular in society and to this day it is commonly analysed in high schools. Several film adaptations of the story have also been made. While the ritual in The Lottery is Jackson's own invention, 
it does share similarities to the rituals surrounding something called the corn spirit in the Golden Bough. In the section of the Golden Bough entitled Corn Spirit Slain in Representatives, Fraser outlines various traditions wherein a person who has been deemed a physical representation of the crops is killed. In this case, the word corn refers to any kind of grain, not the actual crop of corn as we know it today. It has been shown that in rude human society, human beings have been commonly killed to promote the growth of the crops. The victim was put to death as representation of the corn spirit. The ritual described in the lottery mirrors the purpose of the rituals described in the golden bough, although the method of the killing is changed. The rhyme, which is said in the lottery, indicates that the purpose of the ritual is to promote a bountiful harvest. Lottery in June, corn be heavy soon. In the Golden Bough, we are told that these and many similar ceremonies were in their origin magical rites intended to ensure the revival of nature in spring. Primitive man believed that in order to produce the great phenomena of nature on which his life depended, he had only to imitate them. This means that in order to promote the cycle of nature, people need to imitate that cycle in rituals. We will see this concept extensively referenced in the next book I will talk about, which is Harvest Home by Thomas Tryon. Unlike with other stories, I couldn't find any interviews or evidence that Thomas Tryon ever read or was influenced by The Golden Bough, but there are numerous aspects of folklore which are referenced in Harvest Home that are also referenced in The Golden Bough. Of course, this doesn't mean that they were inspired by The Golden Bough, but considering that The Golden Bough was such a massive influence on folklore and how folklore was viewed in society, it's hard not to draw the connection. Let's discuss some of these references to folklore in Harvest Home. Much of the plot of Harvest Home surrounds the tradition of a fertility ritual. Every seven years, one of the young men of the village is crowned as a harvest lord. This person then reigns as the harvest lord for seven years until they are ritually killed at the end of their reign. This tradition serves the same purpose as the ritual in the lottery. The death of the harvest lord, a representation of the corn spirit, represents the harvesting of the crops and the anointment of a new harvest lord is like the coming of new crops. This mirrors the structure of the divine king ritual as described in the Golden Bough. Basically, a divine king is a person from a community who is appointed to this role. This person is then venerated and treated as a king by other people in the community, but at the end of a fixed period of time, Is then killed. This figure can be interpreted as a living representation of the crops and the way crops must be cared for for a fixed term but then must be reaped or killed in order to provide sustenance for the farmers. We could interpret the cyclical death and recrowning of this kingly figure as a representation of the natural cycle of the seasons. The king reigns through the summer only to be killed in the winter and then resurrected or re-crowned before the spring, in time to usher in the next cycle of the seasons. Variations of this concept are widely used in folk horror stories. To get back to Harvest Home though, during the Harvest Lord's reign, he must choose a corn maiden, a female counterpart who represents the new growth of the crops, and who will be a... fertilized by the harvest lord? In other words, they will conduct a fertility ritual which will ensure a fruitful harvest for the next seven years. After this ritual is complete, the harvest lord is killed and a new one takes his place. So we can see how this plot mirrors the divine king as described in the Golden Bough. And this is the main reason why I suspect 
that the Golden Bough was somewhat of an inspiration to Thomas Tryon when writing this book. In an article written for the New York Times, the horror author Stephen King criticised Harvest Home as being a poorly written book, but I would like to strongly argue that it's a much better book than it first appears. Let me explain. The Divine King ritual in Harvest Home is eventually revealed to be part of an ancient Greek religious ceremony known as the Eleusinian Mysteries, which was in fact a real historical religious ceremony. In the modern day, we know very little about the Eleusinian Mysteries, other than that they existed and they were in honour of the Greek goddess Demeter and her daughter Persephone. Demeter is an agricultural goddess and is associated with crops, as is her daughter Persephone. Human sacrifices were not part of the Eleusinian Mysteries as far as I know, but Thomas Tryon uses these as a fictional basis for the ritual in his book. In reality, the Eleusinian Mysteries were known as being one of the most secretive religious ceremonies of the ancient world. The story of Beth Constantine, the main character Ned Constantine's wife, actually roughly follows the story of Persephone. The myth of Persephone and Demeter is as follows. Persephone is abducted and kept as a prisoner in the underworld by Hades, and separated from her mother Demeter. At the end of the myth, Persephone ascends from the underworld and is reunited with her mother. So, here we have a story about a woman who is separated from her mother by a man, and then at the end of the story, she overcomes that man and is reunited with her mother. In Harvest Home, Beth's mother dies early on in Beth's life, and she grows up with her strict father, who is a Christian minister. Beth marries Ned in order to gain independence from her father, although she is not particularly satisfied with her marriage. In this way, Beth has always been a prisoner of the men in her life and both her father and her husband have treated her badly. Her father was controlling, and her husband has cheated on her. So Beth was separated from her mother early on in life, and has since then remained a prisoner of various men in her life, much the same way Persephone was kidnapped by Hades and held as a prisoner. Beth finds a surrogate mother in The Widow Fortune, an older woman who lives in the village. The widow teaches Beth feminine arts, like quilting, and also encourages Beth to have another child. The widow Fortune is kind of a mother figure to the entire village, and she is mainly responsible for organising and conducting the Eleusinian mysteries. In the end of Harvest Home, Beth takes part in these mysteries. In real life, the Eleusinian Mysteries were held at a place called Eleusis, and this is the location where Persephone is said to have ascended from the underworld and been reunited with her mother. So the Eleusinian Mysteries, in real life, are all about celebrating the reunion of Persephone and her mother. In The Golden Bough, we are told that the first part of Demeter's name is derived from an allegedly Cretan word, day, meaning barley, and that accordingly Demeter means neither more nor less than barley mother, or corn mother. When Persephone is reunited with Demeter at the end of her story, it symbolises the coming of spring and the new growth of crops. Persephone, as a goddess, often symbolises vegetation or the new growth of vegetation. And Demeter represents crops. Her name literally means the mother of crops. So, when Persephone is reunited with Demeter at the end of her myth, it's sort of like the growth of new plants that are becoming crops, just the same way that new plants would grow in spring. The Eleusinian mysteries, as described fictionally in Harvest Home, are a fertility ritual meant to bring about the fertility of the land and promote the growth of crops. It's also a ritual 
This celebrates the reunion of a mother and her daughter. Beth's story mirrors this because the widow Fortune has become a surrogate mother to Beth, which is essentially another reunion of a mother and a daughter. At the end of Harvest Home, Ned is blinded because he attempted to prevent the fertility ritual from taking place. Now he needs to be cared for by Beth and other women. Ned no longer has any ability to control Beth, which mirrors the way that Persephone escapes Hades who has been keeping her a prisoner. For all these reasons, I think that Beth's story cleverly mirrors Persephone's myth, albeit in a bit of a rough fashion. Even though it's not generally thought of as such, Harvest Home is really a story about female emancipation. By examining Harvest Home, we can see a rich weave of not just the divine king ritual, but also other ancient myths about the seasons and agriculture. Robin Redbreast The film Robin Redbreast also draws on the Golden Bough and contains many other staples of the folk horror genre. The film is about a young woman who has bought a cottage in a village in the countryside. She becomes increasingly distressed by the actions of the villagers, who seem to be trying to control the course of her life. She is, in true folk horror fashion, the victim of a secret village cult that is trying to conduct an ancient ritual. In the climactic scene of the film, the leader of the conspiracy says that he reads a lot of books on religion, and he specifically names The Golden Bough as one of the books he has read. Study of religions is one of my many interests. I am a reading man, you know. Known for it. You must read a book by Sir James Fraser, The Golden Bough, in seven volumes. But not an English legend. Robin Redbreast deserves a place among the works that are considered to have created folk horror. It contains many of the central themes and plots of folk horror and predates many of the more famous, higher budget films which popularized the genre, especially The Wicker Man. The film was part of a long running British TV series called Play for Today. This program adapted stage plays and classic literature for the television audience but also included original stories as well. The episodes were often written especially for the program and in the style of a play. Robin Redbreast was one of these episodes. Its structure and its direction are very much like a play you would see on a stage. The story unravels slowly, with minimum use of sets and a very small cast of characters. The story itself is very much focused on the drama created between characters and on the personal journey of these characters. Play for Today was part of a cultural movement which was called Kitchen Sink Realism and generally focused on working class Britons and, true to the realism style, explored their domestic lives. The atmosphere of these works is not as different as you might think from horror films. Kitchen Sink Realism is all about the harsh realities of life, and there is a bleakness and reality to Robin Redbreast which is missing from most folk horror. But this is also what makes it so compelling. The two main characters, Nora and Edgar, are certainly not the kind of characters you would see in most folk horror films. Nora is a middle-class Londoner, who, after a bad breakup with her boyfriend, moves to a small village. She is disillusioned with her life, and being on the verge of middle age is feeling very insecure about herself. Edgar is a young man who lives in the village. He is handsome and fit, but also quite socially inept. Due to the machinations of the villagers, Nora and Edgar are thrown together and have a halting romance of sorts, fueled by their mutual loneliness. Robin Redbreast being fairly low budget, chooses to focus on aspects of the story which other horror films wouldn't focus on, particularly the emotions of the characters and small eerie moments, punctuated with surreal dream sequences. Even though the film is really quite brilliant 
It's not the easiest film to watch. There's something about the black and white film and the emotional strain that all the characters are under that made me, as the audience, feel quite distressed while watching the film. The film is available to watch for free on YouTube, and I highly recommend that you check it out. It's quite a good watch, and I think it's very well written. Randall's Round by Eleanor Scott Randall's Round by Eleanor Scott is one of the first works of fiction which I think can genuinely be called folk horror. Before the 1920s, while there were works of horror fiction which incorporated folklore, they lacked the structure of folk horror. In particular, works like Robin Redbreast and The Wicker Man built tension before a climactic ending. This is a very important part of folk horror. Randall's Round is one of the earliest works of fiction where this also happens. In the story, a university student visits a small town called Randall's. While in the town, the student witnesses bizarre and sinister folk traditions and learns of an ancient barrow which exists outside the town. When the student questions the villagers, he receives a none too encouraging response. In the story, the main character recalls an unnamed book in which he remembers reading about traditions practiced in the village of Randalls. While not explicitly stated, I think this is a reference to the Golden Bough. He rummaged in his rucksack and produced a book that Mortlake had lent him, one volume of a very famous book on folklore. There were many accounts of village games and feasts, all traced in a sober and scholarly fashion to some barbaric, primitive rite. The story concludes with the uncovering of a horrible cult within the village which conducts a human sacrifice. As far as the story goes, the ritual seems to be entirely fictional. The reference to the Golden Bough in the story is very interesting. The fact that Eleanor Scott didn't actually name the book, but just hinted at it, suggests that the audience ought to know what the book is, and Scott is just giving a cheeky wink to the audience. The reason I bring this up is not only that Randall's Round is a great tale, but it's also a connection to The Golden Bough as the origin and inspiration for one of the first real folk horror stories. The Temple of Death by A.C. Benson. Speaking of Randall's Round and the very first folk horror stories, The Temple of Death is a notable folk horror story by A.C. Benson from 1911. In this story, we see a ritual which is detailed in The Golden Bough actually become the central plot of the story. The Temple of Death is about a Christian missionary who ventures into the woods of ancient Britain and discovers a pagan temple where human sacrifice is being conducted. The temple is inhabited by a priest who conducts the human sacrifices and is appointed to the role by a very specific means of succession. The pagan priest is bound to the temple for his natural life and can only be replaced if another person kills him. This killer then becomes the new priest of the temple and so the tradition continues. Now, The Golden Bough was written as a study of the priesthood of Diana. Diana being a Roman goddess who was associated with the woods and hunters. This priesthood, according to The Golden Bough, involves exactly the same method of succession that is detailed in The Temple of Death. Fraser describes how, in antiquity, there was a sacred grove dedicated to the goddess Diana. Within this grove, a priest would reside. Fraser tells us that, A candidate for the priesthood could only succeed to office by slaying the priest, and having slain him, he held office till he was himself slain by a stronger or a craftier. So here we see the inspiration for the pagan priest in the Temple of Death. Even though the Temple of Death is set in Britain, not in Italy, where the priesthood of Diana would have resided. The idea of the priesthood has clearly been adapted 
by A.C. Benson to be the religion of the pagan Britons. And so we have another direct link to the Golden Bough hiding in one of the first folk horror stories. To conclude, there are likely even more stories which use the Golden Bough as source material that I haven't found yet. But the capstone of my theory that the Golden Bough is a major source for folk horror is that the writer of The Wicker Man, Anthony Schaefer, used the Golden Bough as a source for researching folklore while he was writing The Wicker Man. It's the real history of folklore, filtered through Margaret Murray and James Fraser, which sparked the imagination of so many authors. After all this research, and in my own personal opinion, the ideas which folk horror are based on are actually a modern creation. Although pagan folk beliefs do survive, there is just no evidence for the kind of evil rituals which are common occurrences in folk horror stories. The idea of these rituals still existing is essentially a modern myth, with very little basis of any kind in real events. The idea is very tantalizing, and for this reason, it grabbed the attention of the public. Let's take a look at why this is, because this is a very important part of the origins of folk horror. The modern context that created folk horror. Even though there are examples of folk horror from before the 1960s and 70s, I would strongly argue that the films which popularized folk horror are all created during the late 60s and the early 70s. There is a definite reason why these films resonated with the audience at that time. The content and themes of these films, for one reason or another, hooked the audience and left them wanting more. But what was it about this particular time period that caused the public to latch on to folk horror in a way that it hadn't earlier? When people talk about the 1960s, the first thing that will come to mind for many people is hippies and the free love countercultural movement. In particular, the resurgence of folk music, the creation of a countercultural movement and communes, the sexual revolution, and a longing, often by young urbanites, to escape the suburban white collar existence that was destined for them and returned to a simpler and more natural way of life. As the catchphrase of the time went, turn on, tune in, drop out. Basically, get in touch with a more authentic way of living. Reject the established status quo. The works of Henry David Thoreau enjoyed a resurgence in the 1960s, particularly a book called Walden, wherein Thoreau propounds self-sufficiency and living close to nature and the land. The relentless progress and materialism of the 1950s was replaced with a yearning for a more authentic and natural way of life. The conflict between these ideas is shown in The Wicker Man, where we see a puritanical policeman confronted with a community that doesn't share his ideas of moral decency. In one of the early scenes of the film, the policeman sees several young couples having sex in the graveyard outside the inn where he is staying, a scene reminiscent of the sexual liberation of the 1960s, but also blasphemous in its flouting of respect for the churchyard. The 1973 novel Harvest Home is another example of this. In the book, we see a family from New York move to a New England town to start a newer, simpler life. The father of the family and the main character leaves his job at a New York firm to become a full-time artist and he and his family enjoy the quaint country lifestyle. In many ways, folk horror seems to be a reaction to the 1960s. Instead of the beautiful, idealistic world that was promised by the hippie generation, folk horror often emphasizes the brutal, difficult, and even deadly problems of living a rural life. Most folk horror doesn't directly deal with the 1960s, but more of the ideas or ideals of the 1960s, the beatification of nature as an all-healing, all-loving force is smashed 
by the reality depicted in folk horror. In The Wicker Man, we are told that the villagers turn to their old religion only after their crops cease to be profitable and they are faced with poverty, a reality of rural life. In The Witch from 2015, we see a family who live on the edge of the wilderness after being excommunicated from their village and who are starving because their crops fail and they can't find food. In the film Antichrist from 2009, a couple retreats to a remote cabin to work through their grief after the death of their son. As they wander through the forest surrounding the cabin, instead of beautiful nature, they find animals horribly suffering in the woods. And in a surreal scene, we hear a voiceover telling us that Chaos reigns. And Nature is Satan's church. What? In Hagazusa from 2017, we see a woman struggling to survive with the little resources that she has when she is isolated from a nearby community. The list could go on and on. The harsh reality of rural life is far from the peaceful, easy living that is often dreamed of by those who have never lived in the countryside. No doubt many people who have made a sea change to live an easier life in the country found themselves confronted with a similar reality. In Harvest Home, after the Constantine family moved to the countryside, we are told this in a conversation. People often ignored the fact that life a hundred years ago was not easy. Time put a patina of affection on yesteryear, and we tended to forget how appalling existence could be in those times. How long and how hard a man had to labour for his food. How difficult childbearing was. How few medicines and conveniences there were. How stern the realities of life. During the 1960s, the space between rural communities and urban communities was shrinking, especially in the United Kingdom. As urban centres grew, cars became commonplace, and education was more readily available, it became increasingly easy for people to move and commute between urban and rural areas, and also to completely change their place of living. In the 1960s, there was a modernisation of the English road system, and for the first time, motorways were built, allowing faster travel across the country. People from urban areas were now easily able to access rural areas and to move there. As it's put in Harvest Home, city mouse into country mouse. People and communities who were previously comfortably distant were now within reach, and perhaps that was too close for comfort for some people, especially those in rural areas, who found their villages invaded by urbanites. It's hardly surprising that this anxiety was expressed in film and media. Rural communities can be very friendly and welcoming, but they can also be insular and hostile. I grew up in a small country town myself, and while people from outside the community were tolerated, often the length of time you'd lived in the town dictated how accepted you were in the community. Many urbanites may have found this, as they visited or moved into more rural areas. This is a rather common trope of folk horror, a city slicker who makes their way into a rural community but is not welcomed or treated with hostility. No doubt this had been an experience of many people in the 1960s and 70s. In the novel Harvest Home, when the Constantine family moved to the country town, They say this about the locals. We had arrived outsiders, city people, not wanted on the voyage. They had been aloof, not unfriendly, but as remote from us as their village was from the roads and highways. I think the confluence of all these cultural shifts made folk horror appealing to the masses. 
This new source of horror came at just the right time. The era of monster movies was over, Frankenstein and Dracula were old hat, and the audience was ready for something new, something shocking and brutal and bloody. Folk horror delivers on these desires. There is debaucherous sex in The Wicker Man and The Blood on Satan's Claw. There's shocking violence in Witchfinder General. And to top it all off, a horror that lies waiting just around the corner in the next village over. The threat in folk horror is something new, but it's also something old and familiar, something that has always been there. One of the central ideas of the folk revival of the 1960s was that older things were better, and in folk horror this is perverted. Older things are evil and heathen and dangerous. The idyllic nature, which was so idealized in the 1960s, is now positioned in the context of horror and is a source of fear. Folk horror took advantage of inverting the ideals of the 1960s to shock the audience, but it also took advantage of some more deeply held prejudices. I've heard it said that all horror stems from a fear of the other. Something or someone which is unfamiliar, unknown, and therefore also possibly dangerous. Small, isolated rural communities are a prime candidate for being portrayed as the other. By nature, they are exclusive, inscrutable, unpredictable. Anything could be taking place in these out-of-the-way places. Murder, lawlessness, debauchery. Today, in most developed nations, about 85% of the population live in urban areas. For the vast majority of the population... Rural people do represent the other, something totally different from what they know and understand, an unknown factor, and therefore dangerous. In folk horror, rural communities are often portrayed, at best, as being backwards and ignorant, and at worst, as being hostile, violent, and incestuous. These tropes piggyback on actual prejudices that exist in the world. Rural people are often thought of as violent or backwards by city people. And city people are often seen as being smug, soft and incompetent by country people. In Harvest Home, we see the rural people described like this. It's awful the way they've inbred. They're all direct descendants of the original family. Once or twice removed. Cousins marrying cousins. That sort of thing. Some of them are a little... You know, she tapped the side of her temple. Other genres of horror films also exploit these ideas as well. The 1972 film Deliverance is one such example that comes to mind. Although I wouldn't class these films as being folk horror, they're definitely, uh, kissing cousins, shall we say? James Thurgill from the University of Tokyo, in an essay about folk horror, points out that the further into rural areas a person goes, the further they are from civilization and the security which that offers. Hospitals and police are suddenly very distant and people feel very isolated when they are in a rural area. They are a long way from any kind of help. As you go further into rural areas, the further you are away from civilization and the further into the wild and uncontrolled chaos where anything could happen. Chaos reigns. Final thoughts. Folk horror is such a fascinating genre to me because it has been created and developed within living memory. Certainly this isn't uncommon. There are other genres that come to mind, Scandinavian noir is one such, but often new genres like these are more like subgenres and blend elements from two or more established genres to create a new flavor. This is true of folk horror. It utilizes aspects of horror which have been around for a long time. But folk horror is interesting because it turns new earth within the horror genre and sows new crops. Its subject is 
is the distant past, an ancient history, and the older, the better. This is a new ingredient to the horror genre. I'm excited to see what the folk horror genre brings in the future. The last few years have brought some of the strongest entries into the folk horror genre yet. Midsummer from 2019 is a great example, a classic folk horror tale, but with the newer, more psychological elements added to the cauldron. The same too could be said of The Witch from 2015 and Hagazusa from 2017. If this new blood in the folk horror genre indicates anything, it's this. Folk horror is around to stay, for now and the future. I hope you've enjoyed this essay about the origins of folk horror. Stay tuned for more content. If you want to support the channel, please consider buying one of the audiobooks on my Bandcamp page. I'll leave a link below in the description. All these audiobooks are available for free on my YouTube channel, but if you would like the MP3s of the audiobooks, you can buy them and pay whatever you want, whether that be $1 or $10. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.